Welcome to the series, See You at Home for a Concordia Community. I appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. My name is Melanie Gudgeon, and I am an alumni officer at Concordia University. I'll be helping Taya manage today's session, and I will moderate the chat environment. I look forward to seeing your comments and questions so that I may relay them to Taya. Now a little bit about our guest today. Taya is a licensed dietitian with L'Ordre Professionnel des Diététistes du Québec and Dietitians of Canada. She supervises the activities in the nutrition suite at Concordia's Perform Centre. The Perform Centre provides an integrated and comprehensive environment to promote healthier lives through changes in behaviour and lifestyle by offering research opportunities, education and preventative-based programmes. Taya counsels patients coping with diabetes, food allergies, gastrointestinal conditions, weight management, eating disorders, and I could go on. We're very lucky to have Taya here to provide nutrition tips while also preparing a hearty salad for all of us. So now I turn it on to you, Taya. Thanks, Melanie, and welcome to my kitchen. And we're going to be making a lentil barbecue corn salad from lentils.ca and Cookspiration. So just a brief overview of our plan today. We're gonna to look at the recipe, the food allergies that are indicated on it, and then we'll, we'll go over the steps we've already done and put together our salad. And then after we put the salad together, I'd like to share with you the nutritional value of the recipe and how it fits into Canada's food guide. I have a couple points about food safety and then also some information about the impact that our food choices have on the environment. So let's get started. So we have the recipe here, and you might have noticed that it has a contain and a may contain statement, and it indicates allergens. We indicate on our recipes at Perform Health Canada's priority allergens, and we do that by looking at the back of the packets where they have this label, and then we transfer that onto the recipe just to ensure everyone's safety. Now, you might have from your ingredients at home, including your spices, um, you might not have these same allergens. It all depends on the, the brand, the packet, um, the, the uh, factory that it was produced in, and this can change from time to time. Um, but just so you know that that's why that is indicated there. So this recipe is vegan, gluten-free, and there's no other allergens um, listed on the backs of any of the ingredients. So it's one of my go-tos when we have a lunch and learn. Um, I've used it also in, in our pharma pre menu for our breast cancer participants and for um, people coming for different events at our kitchen and perform. So I wanted to share what I've done already. Um, I rinsed and cooked the, some, some green lentils from dry, and I cooked frozen corn in the microwave. I used the directions on the back of my pack of frozen corn, and I did two batches. I did one batch of four cups for around seven minutes, and I added a little bit of water, and I just covered it with a plate to make sure it didn't spark. And I did another batch of three and a half cups for around six minutes. I also covered that. I strained the extra water and rinsed uh, the, the green lentils and the corn to, to chill them. And then I combined them together in a bowl and I chilled them in the fridge. Now the recipe does say that you can um, enjoy this recipe warm and you can do that if you would like to. I'm going to use this for um, another meal, probably for lunch tomorrow too. And we just prefer vegetables with the crunch. So that's why I chilled everything so that my vegetables won't get soggy um, when I add them to the, the corn and the lentils. So the other parts that I've completed is I rinsed some cilantro and I tore it into bite-sized pieces. The recipe mentions chopping the cilantro. You can do that too. Um, you can also use a different type of green. You can use um, any leafy type of green. It could be baby spinach, it could be parsley, um, anything that you have on hand. Then I have some chopped um, peppers. So here I have, um, I have red peppers, two and a quarter cup. In the picture, you'll see um, orange. So I'm gonna go ahead and add those to my, um, my corn lentils. And then I have my green onions here. So it's around a third of a cup. You can use the whole part of the green onion, the whole stalk, except for maybe the very end of it. 
and you can use most of the bulb of the onion as well. You can cut the, um, the very the roots off. You can even use those to regrow some of your green onion if you would like. Um, and for people who have any digestive upset, uh, eating green parts of the onions can, can often be helpful for some symptoms of um, digestive upset, depending on your, your condition. So I'm going to add my cilantro as well. And then we're going to make our dressing. So I have my um, lime juice coming from a fresh lime. And I also took the zest off the lime. If you don't have a lime, that's okay. You can use the lemon um, and you can use lemon juice or lime juice also from a bottle. If you prefer even to use a vinegar, you could use a red wine vinegar. Uh, you could use balsamic, anything to give that little kind of a um, tangy, astringent taste to the oil. I'm using canola and olive oil mix. However, if you don't have that, you could use a different kind of um, oil that you prefer in your salad dressing as well. And then I'm also going to add my salt and pepper. So it's a teaspoon each of those. And I'm adding my zest. I just used a regular little grater to zest my lime. And I have that here. I'm gonna add that into my vinaigrette as well. So I'm gonna mix that up after because one of the last ingredients is a jalapeno. And this is one I grew from my garden. I froze it and I washed it. And now we're gonna chop it up. Before we do, I know we have some kids on, um, on this webinar as well. So I just wanna share some little knife safety tips. So we wanna use a sharp knife rather than a dull one. And we wanna cut on a flat surface. Oh, here he is. I just wanna share from Kid Food Nation, it's okay? There we go. Kid Food Nation here. Today I'm going to be making a knife skills lesson. Lesson. A knife skills lesson. Today I'm making a knife skills lesson. Start with a sharp knife because it's safer than a dull one. Be sure an adult's present when you use a knife. If I'm cutting something round, like a carrot, I carefully slice it in half first so I can put the flat side on the cutting board so it stays in place. Always hold the food you're cutting with a hand shaped like a claw with your fingers tucked under, like this. Okay, the tip of your knife always stays on the cutting board. Carefully lift and lower the handle. There, drop carrots. Don't forget to take it slow. There's more at GetFoodNation.com. Words. That sounds. <laughs> There, so he says it better than I can. Um, so for our jalapeno, we did, I cut it on a flat surface and I cut it in half first. Um, and then I'm just gonna put my tip here into my compost after. Hey, Taya. I did work on, yeah? Sorry, small question for you here. Um, so I do have a question here from Aiz, who's saying, you know, how sometimes people get bloated when they eat lentils and beans, and she's just wondering if there's an alternative for that, or if there might be particular herbs or spices that might help to alleviate something like that, that can kind of counteract for that. Any suggestions? Yes. Um, well, it can depend too on the quantity that, that you have um, of your beans or your lentils at any one time. Um, so this, when you mix it all up, um, the actual quantity of lent lentils will be under a portion. Um, so for some approaches where if, for if people are having more sensitivities to some of the, what they call the fermentable carbohydrates that can occur sometimes that are in our, our lentils and beans, if we're under a certain threshold of a portion, and again, each person is very different in terms of their symptoms, but often just having a little bit less of the that particular food that provokes your symptoms can be helpful. Um, there's an approach that you might have heard about um, called FODMAPs where they recommend um, 
looking at your symptoms and then reintroducing, but always, it's never to eliminate completely forever. It's about reintroducing pay, paying attention to the portion that is your threshold. Um, so, and so for a lot of the beans and lentils, it means having um, portions starting from like a quarter cup or less and then um, building up a, a full size portion is a half a cup of lentils. But in this recipe, because you're combining it with the other vegetables, you will get less than um, a half a cup of the, the lentils when you eat your 250 grams of the, um, the salad. So I, I hope that's somewhat helpful. Combining it also with having um, like a dressing that has um, that has like a vinegar can be helpful. Some ginger as well could be helpful. That doesn't quite work in this recipe, but there are other recipes where that can be a possibility. So just continuing our little knife. Um, any other questions, Melanie, or is that okay if I continue with the, the knife um, skills session? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, interestingly, we have Nima who is saying how she tends to use um, cumin. She feels that that helps to reduce some of the bloating. Oh, that's great. Yes, it can be very individual because there's there's so many different types of fermentable carbohydrates. So it's um and and even when they've done some studies looking at the FODMAP approach, it for some people it works, for some people um, no. So the it's recommended to keep a log of your symptoms and, and what you eat, and then um, and then you can work uh, with a professional like a dietitian to see about reintroducing foods and how that can um, work for you and for your symptoms. So I've chopped my little jalapeno up. Um, I have my seeds. I'm going to keep them in because we like a little kick here, um, and I'm going to put them into my salad right here. And then I'm just going to um, unshare my slides because uh, we'll mix up the salad um, together. So the fourth tip that um, that our little friend from Kid Food Nation mentioned is that we keep the tip of the knife on the board and then we just move it back and forth like a lever, uh, not going up and down because if you go, the more we raise it, the more we increase our chance of um, slipping and cutting ourselves. So, so now I'm just going to mix up our dressing and what, what we're going to do is we're going to mix it up until it's what we call emulsified. So what does that mean? It's really just a fancy way of saying all mixed up where the oil and vinegar are no longer separate. So once I have it mixed up so that it's not separate, then I'm going to pour it over my salad. There we go. And then I'm just going to toss my salad so that it coats everything. So if you're going to eat this right away for lunch, um, then you can you can leave this out to, to portion it after we're done here. If you're going to have it for another meal, like say as part of your supper or your lunch tomorrow, then I would recommend chilling it in the fridge because uh, we want to to minimize the time um, for all of our food spent in the danger zone. And the danger zone, that's the temperature mostly like around room temperature, anything above the temperature of your fridge, so anything above four degrees and up to 60 degrees Celsius. And that's the temperature when bacteria like to grow and divide. So we wanna minimize that by chilling our foods promptly and um, freezing any leftovers that we're not going to, to be eating. And I have some resources um, available for you also that talk about safe food storage. So here we have our beautiful salad. You see it's nice and colorful. Hey Anne, do we have an idea as to how long it can store in the fridge, such a yeah. salad? Yeah, so a salad like this, it would be good to use up before four days um, in the fridge. Uh, so about around eight portions. So for, um, if you have um, a family of four, it'll be gone in like two meals. Um, 
maybe less because uh, the portions that it has on the recipe, it's for around one and a third cup uh, each. So, um, any other questions about the recipe? So far, well, so good. Thank you so much. So far, so good. So I'll just share with you the nutritional value. Um, oh, I see some people saying hi. Uh, thanks, Laura and Elise. Um, so I'll just share. I'll go back to sharing um, our nutritional content of the recipe. So here we have a nutrition facts label because at the form we have some nutrient analysis software on the computer and we enter in all the ingredients and then and the amounts too and then it gives us a little label like this and this can be helpful in um, making our choices. So we want to choose items that have less saturated and trans fats, sodium and added sugars, and foods that have more dietary fiber and protein. So how can we do that? We can use this little rule of 5% is a little, 15% is a lot. So if we look at this recipe here, do we have any questions, Melanie? We do actually. We have a question from Christina and she's just wondering if you have suggestions with regards to what you can combine this salad with, what kind of food combinations you would you see? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we think in terms of our, our healthy balanced plate, we are getting a starchy vegetable, the corn, and then we're getting our, our vegetables, like we have the leafy greens, the, um, the onions, and we have other chopped vegetables. So we have a lot of our vegetable part of the plate covered, the protein, we almost have it covered, but we can combine that say with either a glass of milk or yogurt or cheese um, or, or some, um, nuts if we want to have a, like a little bit of um, nuts as an after snack and then we can also have it say with um, it might be nice with some tortillas um, and then as a combination to fill out the grain portion of the meal so from this um, this meal if we look at the protein content we're getting around 10 grams and that's from um, a portion of 250 grams which is around one and a third cups so you might eat a little bit more um, and then you might get 15 grams if you add a glass of milk or a, a portion of yogurt then you're probably up to around 25 grams which is around the recommended amount that um, people can have at a meal in order to maintain their muscle mass and you see here there's zero percent added sugars and the sodium, we're at around 12%. Um, but dietary fiber, we're at a whopping 25%. So this is a great source of dietary fiber um, for this recipe. Any other okay. questions? Yeah, we actually have a question from Lynn. And she's wondering, is there a preference with regards to the color or the types of lentils used? Are there nutritional differences between one or the other? Great question. So you could use a brown lentil or um, a, a black lentil. However, I wouldn't recommend using a red lentil because those tend to um, to really kind of uh, they'll lose their their shape and texture. They're better for soups or sauces. Um, but you could use uh, black beans or kidney beans or chickpeas. Um, if you wanted to do um, in, in place of the lentils as well. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of possibilities here with this recipe. It's very versatile. Um, and how it fits in terms of Canada's food guide. So in, in 2019, Canada released our new food guide after an extensive review of the evidence. Um, and they found that what is helpful is a pattern of meals and snacks. Because that's what we eat, meals and snacks as opposed to focusing just on one nutrient or superfood. So, so if we look at the proportions of the plate, again, we used to have um, portion, the idea of portions and counting them throughout the day. What they found was that people wanted a practical tool when they come to the moment of eating to know, okay, how do I, um, how do I choose what I want to eat? So we can have half of our plate, our container, being um, vegetables and fruits. So our leafy dark green ones, brightly colored orange or red ones, um, any variety of vegetables or fruits. You don't have to have all that variety though, but some. And then having your protein foods. So by that, that could be um, 
beans or legumes. It could also be fish, meat, poultry, eggs, um, nuts, seeds, tofu, a variety of, um, of items fit into our protein foods. And then we want to have a whole range. So that could be a pasta, it could be bread, wild rice, quinoa. Um, it could also be things like tortilla, um, or um, it could be some of the starchy vegetables that you see from on the vegetable side of the plate, like the sweet potato or potato. A lot of people count those over with our grains. It's our body responds to them in the same way that it responds to grains. And then we want to keep in mind also to, to drink often, making water our drink of choice, um, to choose bright color, because often that can be a guide for helping us um, meet our needs as well, because if it's colorful, we're usually getting a variety of nutrients. And that can be a good strategy for meeting our needs for vitamins, minerals, and carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and dietary fiber for most of us. Um, there are there are, of course, some special conditions or if you're having a medication where it might decrease um, your absorption of some of your food that you might um, have some special considerations. But for most of us, this is a great strategy. So we can look at a practical example. So uh, we asked participants actually as part of a research project when they were preparing a salad to move the grain and the beans on one half of the bowl and then all the vegetables on the other half of the bowl and then mix it up so you get an idea of this kind of half plate or the proportions um, uh, of the meal and then they mix it up and it looks like this. So it's a simple idea, and again, most of you have probably heard of it before. However, from research published last year, they found that only 11% of Canadians still have their plate with fruits and vegetables every meal. So we still um, have a way to go in terms of making it a, a daily habit. So in terms of food safety, you might have heard me mention some um, points while, while we were making a salad. So we want to minimize the being spent in the temperature danger zone, which is between four and 60 degrees Celsius. And that's when bacteria grow and reproduce rapidly. So we want to refrigerate and freeze all leftovers to minimize the chance of bacteria growing. And again, we have this safe food storage link that um, we'll be sending to you from Health Canada. And it has recommendations in terms of the number of days, depending on what you're making and how long you can keep it. Do we have any other questions in the chat? We're all good so far, Taya. Keep up the good, good. work. Yep, okay. thank you. So then in terms of the food choices, so this recipe is vegan. So in terms of how that can have an impact on the environment, researchers had looked at uh, the impact of different foods in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, water use or water acidification. And then they've, um, they've made tables in terms of which foods have a bigger impact. And it makes a pyramid that looks like this upside down, where the foods that have the most impact are at the top of the pyramid and those that have the least impact um, have, are at the bottom of the pyramid. So you might notice that the plant-based foods like our vegetables, fruits, or grains uh, are more near the bottom of the pyramid. And often these are the foods that the recommendations um, encourage us to eat more of. So they're kind of like opposites. And so if we eat what is recommended in terms of a lot of uh, food guides around the world and also a lot of dietary patterns from around the world. So I just have a few beautiful examples here of different food guides from around the world and also different dietary patterns um, from around the world. And a lot of them emphasize a lot of plant-based food. So this is not just a new idea. It's actually a very traditional um, and ancient idea to, to protect the earth um, over time. Any yeah. other questions? We do, we do. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've got two questions here. Uh, so Christine is wondering, um, for people who have children and who may not be great fans of tomatoes, do you have any tips or tricks on how to have them eat more tomatoes? That's the first one. And then I, uh, we have another question here with regards to refrigerating hot food. Uh, should we wait for it to cool down before refrigerating it? 
And oh. I'm actually looking at the time, just one little thing. It is 1128 already. So I think what we'll do is uh, any follow-up questions afterwards, we can maybe reply after the segment so that, because uh, I know that you still have a number of little slides to go through with lots of very interesting content here. But I'll let you answer those two last questions, okay? Sounds good. Yeah, Thank so you, Dan. For, yeah, for, for encouraging tomatoes, um, if you want to incorporate it into something that you're making, so, um, so sometimes that could be spaghetti, it could be um, pizza as part of the sauce, um, and, but it could be just um, emphasizing two vegetables that they do enjoy. So sometimes um, if, like, if people also enjoy like say um, peppers, like those pepper strips could be a, a great thing to, to have on their salad meat instead of the, the diced potatoes. But um, often just incorporating something within something else, it can be, it can help um, to get a little bit of that in there. But often in terms of food preferences, with kids over time, there's been some studies looking at this, and it's like gardening. It takes time. Um, if you can expose kids to a variety of different foods, they're gonna have their likes and dislikes, and then they might come back to it later um, when they're older. But the more different things they're exposed to, the research demonstrates that it just gives them more of a, a varied palette um, or, and still an increased chance that they'll like a lot more different foods um, later on. So if you don't like tomatoes now, I wouldn't sweat it too much and just try and get it in but if not that's fine too and just go with what you like so then the second question was about um um oh i'm forgetting what it was sorry but um the it, it was it was with regards to the food uh with regards to hot foods and um, oh yes, and chilling them yes yeah so it is because it's and this is a challenge we want to try and get back down to four degrees within um, a two hour period so I would recommend um, portioning it um, and then if you are going to freeze it to put it into the portion that you're going to use to it out later and freeze it, put it in the freezer um, as soon as you can because that will bring down the temperature more rapidly. Um, if you're not going to be freezing it, but say it's like um, a salad like this and you want to chill it, I would put it in the fridge promptly because we want to again bring that temperature as quickly as possible and it can mean to separate it into smaller portions um, and not chilling a whole bunch of things at the same time. So sometimes it can be staggering when you're cooking what so that you're not filling with your fridge with a whole bunch of hot items because then it'll raise the whole temperature of the fridge um, so you want to to just cook a few um, like maybe one or two things at a time and chill that um, so so it, it, it is a bit of um, an organizational uh, balance in terms of those two questions so I just want to share um, and thank you so much for those great questions I just want to share a little bit about where I come from so I get to work at the perform center so here you see our beautiful facade out at the Loyola campus and we have community programs on the conditioning floor um, in our cardiopulmonary suite and our athletic therapy clinic um, and so that's uh, you can join us there. Um, however, now we are offering some virtual content. I, I work in nutrition suite downstairs in the basement. We have two kitchens. We have our teaching kitchen up on the left there and our metabolic kitchen in the center where we prepare some meals. And you see that you're there from the meals that we prepared, um, some frozen meals as part of our one of our research projects, and you see Dr. Santosa, our scientific lead um, for the nutrition seat. And we hold a permit from MAC in order to prepare um, meals to use as part of our research projects. And you might be wondering, how do I get to be a part of these research projects to have food prepared for me? Um, so how you can do that, if you just Google Concordia Perform Research, you will come to our page and you can go to the little tab here that says research and then click on participate in research. That will take you to this page here. Then you can click on subscribe for our email alerts, um, either subscribe or the little sign up button. And then that'll take you here. And then you just enter your email address. You can sign up to have news from Perform. You can sign up to be, um, to be here about different research projects. I click right here. 
and you can also um, learn about our different events. Then you'll get notified for research projects that are going on that you might be eligible for, and then you can contact the researcher if you're able and, and interested in the criteria to participate. So that's a little bit about where I get to work. Um, so I thank you so much for your time um, with me here, and I hope you enjoy your lunch. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Taya. Um, so I want to thank all of you as well for joining us today. It's really much appreciated. Did you enjoy this session? Uh, please let me know what you thought in the chat box. And also, uh, if you have great pictures of your solid creations, we do invite you to share them for us on hashtag see you at home. As you know, this, is, this webinar is part of our family-focused programming. Uh, we know that many people are home right now with their children, and we want to keep content uh, family-friendly and engaging for all of you. Um, in, in fact, we'll actually be on Monday hosting a painting workshop at two o'clock uh, for adults and children alike. Um, and seeing as how we have many more activities coming up, I do invite you to keep an eye on your inbox for any future email invitations. You can also register on our website. That's it for me. Thank you for joining us again. Hope you had a great rest of the day. Stay safe and keep on cooking. Bye everybody.